Um, my name is Jasmine Wahi. I'm the Holly Block Social Justice Curator here in the Virtual Bronx Museum. And I am thrilled to excite you in, to welcome you, not to excite you, but maybe that too, to our program today. Um, and before we kick off the program, um, I know that you can see us, we can't see you, um, but I like to kick these off with a short moment of silence. And thank you for that. Um, and this program and this exhibition, um, Sean Leonardo, Breath of, The Breath of Empty Space, um, we've decided to engage a series of poets who are creating poetic responses to the work. And each program that we do, we kick off with a poetic response. Um, so today, I'm actually going to get started by playing that response. And a year and some change into it, even though I rehearse this every time, I still get confused about Zoom. So bear with me for a moment. I think it's just Zoom nerves. Okay. The world as is. Between two points of sleep, they tell me I'm awake. Alive is a kind of engine, and I rev my dog, and it walks me. Alive, I'm inside of someone who hates me. My dog turns on its body, takes a piss, and home gnaws a bone and sleeps. What is left there to dream of? Say the bone hand of a knife peaks and the steel pivots through a soft hill of lungs. And what could I possibly say from that vantage of pain married silence? Speak a field of black dahlias into red and think anything I say saves anyone, myself included. Lion against knife, against flower, against this dog country, and somehow what survives? Dog that stirs like a greater beast, set your sights on me. Awaken, awaken, eat. Before we continue with our program and introductions from our three incredible artists, um, the poet Jim Encio has asked um, for us to share his reflections on the egregious hate crime that occurred last week um, and has shared a letter with Sean, which he's now going to share with us. Dear class, I approach this from how I feel, not through academics or statistics. Granted, there is plenty of that to quantify hatred. I know a rupture in my body. There's bitterness, there's rage, there's guilt. 
Why is it the deaths of someone I don't know will never meet fill me with such bitter rage? After all, murder happens in America daily and to black and brown lives even more often. I sympathize when I read it in the news. I say I understand. I donate. I mouth solidarity. Then why did the Atlanta shooting sting more dearly? I am bitter. I open the fridge door to quench a sweetness that will better my mood, a tonic to save myself from myself and my partner who broods next to my Asian experience. My tongue strikes like a whip. I feel guilty. I save him from myself. What I drink is bitter. My partner is white and I blame him for watching TV for pleasure. We're going to the market with no fear of a knife in the back for entering without fear and anger, the two always exist together. While I'm always on the lookout for disaster while reaching for something that will let me live. And this is someone I love dearly and he tries his best, but my life is not his. And I understand my relationship with my lover is a foil. The gaze of the lover assumes the lovers are equal and my partner's white gaze tells him I am like him. How do I tell him I am not? White America tells Asian Americans we are like them, that the field is open. We are not. We cannot love the white body the same way the white body loves us. Asian American life should not be visible only when the white body wants to see it. The whole of Asian American experience isn't invisibility. It's not a superpower. We escape notice. Notice our black and brown neighbors dive from. We are ignored. Maybe it's the perception we are foreign, meek, effect, weak, docile, a bug squashed at will. Only visible when we, rising like a tide of locusts, suddenly sing, or someone wants to make us visible and shoots. Maybe it's because Kim, Kim Young Joon looks like my mother. And like my own dead mother, she had two sons. She immigrated to what the Korean language translates as beautiful country. She worked graveyard hours tending very likely to exhausted immigrant workers like herself. And still, she saved the best food and the best dress for her children while carrying the shame of being a single mother and the shame of being called a sex worker. There's nothing wrong with being any of these things and neither is there shame in being poor, whatever this country says about poverty. I think about my mother, her narrow escape from US border patrol hiding under the bushes, her three day walk through California, her undocumented status of 20 years, her three botched abortions because she was too afraid to go to a doctor, her inability to eat save one meal a day without getting sick, her 12 hour work days while all the while doing what the world told her a wife and mother should be because she was a woman and because she was Asian she wasn't allowed to speak. And I would guess there are moments when you think about your family when this happens. And the closer to disaster you feel, think about how difficult it is for one person to carry the colossal weight of an entire society and know you alone are not responsible for the entirety of a social ill. That even though each terrible event feels like your own terrible crystal, there are so many others who carry the same terror. I know this is small comfort. The Asian American life feels like a transient one. Even as we are woven into the fabric of America, we are simultaneously told our threads don't exist. And if our threads are dyed, we are told we are foreign. We are eternal strangers in a familiar land because we are told so, but this is our home. And even as I, like you, question myself in solidarity, I'm honest with myself. I don't know the pain in being a black or brown American. I don't know what it means to be a white American, even as I am told I am infinitely closer to it. They are wrong. What I do know is that the individual pain we live with is also the pain of those so grossly murdered and wrong just for being who we are. That is something I understand and something I can grab with my own hands and wrestle into something good. I hope each of you are well. I'm here for you. Sincerely, Jinan.
Thank you for sharing that, Sean. Um, and thank you, Jimin, for writing that. That was, um, I just need a moment. Um, so today's conversation is, I guess, um, sort of adjacent to those words. And we are talking about representation and representation um, through artwork, through visual arts, through multidisciplinary arts. But in this case, um, with the three incredible artists who I have the pleasure of speaking with today, Jamel, Steve, and Sean, um, through predominantly drawing, painting, and lens-based photography. Um, I don't think that these three artists need any introduction. They are all very well known to all of you, I'm sure. However, um, my colleague Nell is going to drop bios and links to um, each of their work and their websites, as well as additional material in the chat where you can peruse on your own. And I think we're just going to jump into it. Um, for those of you who know me, who know Sean, um, actually all of us, we are not for the faint of heart. And so I'm really excited to just get into it. <laughs> oh, that was beautiful. That was really beautiful. <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, so, you know, the first question I have actually comes out of a conversation, an email conversation that Steve, you and I had. Um, in which you challenged me, and rightfully so, um, about the purpose of this talk. Because we often find ourselves as persons of color, um, A, as somehow being representative of our communities within the framework of, within the institutional framework, particularly art institutions um, that have historically been hegemonically kind of pandering to a white gaze. Mm -hmm. And the question is, why are we the ones talking about representation or representation um, when really we should also be calling um, our white colleagues to task to be in conversation either with us or with themselves. Um, and it's very often not framed around whiteness. Um, and so I guess to, to kind of start, I'd love to hear um, all three of your thoughts on this kind of query of why, why us, um, why don't we have these conversations sort of more in dialogue? Um, and then I'll tell you, I'll tell you my rationale for why. So, um, I guess actually, yeah. Steve, why don't we start with you? Yeah. You know, I think that, uh, first of all, the, the poem that Sean read so beautifully, right? I don't know how you can be human and not see yourself in that poem, right? That's the first part of it, right? Um, Jamil is a fantastic artist. If you cannot see yourself in his work, then that's your problem, right? So why are you talking to me about my community when we don't have that conversation about other artists whose work is supposed to be universal, right? Matthew Barney has a whole career about athleticism and masculinity, right? That's Sean Leonardo's career, right? But whenever we talk to Sean, we wanna talk about being black. Mm -hmm. Like, can we talk to Matthew Barney about being white? Can we just have that conversation? Like Matthew, how does whiteness show up in your work? Cause you know, we, I get asked that question all the time, right? And no one um, who is a thinking person would think that an artist is only interested in one position, right? The fact that I can identify with a Korean man who's had a single mother, because I had a single mother, right? It, my mother was not Korean, but she was a single mother, right? And I get really, really tired of being told that I can't understand someone else's experience. And that other thing that he said that was so beautiful, someone's death affects me, mm -hmm. even though I don't know that person. Like that is the human experience. You know, that goes back to John Donne, you know, for whom the bell tolls. You know, that is like the human experience, that one loss is all of our losses, right? And so all this sort of stuff like um, you, you can't understand unless you're this person, or you can't 
understand this because you're not from this direct experience. It always seemed crazy to me. And frankly, it always seemed a way to stop uh, really amazing black artists from being talked about as really great artists. Uh, Jamel, if it's, if it's okay, I'd like to, to extend Steve's thoughts here. And, and, and actually I wanna bring something forth that you said in uh, one of our last conversations as well, Steve, in which you clarified and admitted I think it was the, in the context of Philip Gustin that you, as a black man, see yourself in the work, in that work. Yeah. And so I would like in this context to reverse the question, question and ask our audience and anyone else that, that where this might reverberate, how is it that white individuals see themselves in the work of these three artists present in this space? Right. I think that is a valuable question. And while the work on view in the breath of empty space absolutely addresses the collective trauma of having to internalize the deaths of all of the black and brown human beings in this work, you damn well believe I'm implicating the white gaze in how they do or do not identify in those scenes. That is absolutely go. part of the strategy. And in a few of the works, it is a deliberate implication in that there is mirror tint applied to the drawings so that you have to choose whether you perceive yourself as victim and or aggressor. And that being uh, the intention at the heart of the work. I'm gonna kick it over to Jamal. You're muted, Jamel. Oh, Take yourself you're muted, brother. Okay. There you go. Wow. Uh, you guys dropped some serious science there. Uh, my journey has been really interesting uh, over time. My introduction to the world, the white world and black world came really early for me when I was young. You know, and I picked up a book called Black and White America. Ironically, it was by a Jewish photographer, Lynn Freed. And uh, it's at that point at nine years old, back in 1969, I picked up that book and that exposed me to a world outside my community. And it's at that point that I realized the type of world that I would be living in and the struggles I would endure. It's through that book, I was introduced to racism for the very first time, you know, and it educated me to a world I just didn't know anything about. My parents never told me about it, mm -hmm. but it's that book that pretty much set me on the path in which I'm on right now. And to my surprise, in the production of my book back in the days that came out in 2001, it allowed me to go into worlds that I would have never imagined going into, you know, throughout my life. That book became a global language amongst young people in countries that I would have never imagined would have embraced it. When I first produced it, it was produced for my local community, really Brooklyn. But when it came out, it resonated throughout the whole entire globe. And that reality came present to me when I traveled to Suwon, Korea in 2008 for an international b-boy co competition called R16, where b-boys around the world come together to celebrate hip hop. And it amazed me because my work for some reason was a cornerstone of that exhibition in conjunction to the work of Joe Conzo, you know, from the Bronx. Right. And I was surprised that people, you know, Russians, uh, 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 people from Belgium, France, uh, England, Brazil, Japan, China, embraced the work in which I created. And at that point, I felt that this, 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 this hope and possibility that we can come together as a larger society and start to have conversations. I used my imagery to create a language to bring us together in conversation. That was very important to me. So. I'm, I'm blessed to be on this journey and to be a, 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 a torchbearer to create these conversations that I think are very necessary. And since entering Instagram in particular, I've used my platforms to create conversations. When we speak about hatred towards Asians, I felt the need to address it in a very unique way that bothered me when I came up because my introduction to hatred towards Asians, particularly Vietnamese, came with the war in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. And I cannot let that go. It's like years have passed and people weren't talking about it. 
but I had to bring those conversations up amongst everybody. Both, and the responses were amazing because I felt that we needed to talk about this war. I could not let that go by because a lot of the hate that we see now, I feel personally is rooted in some of the wars in which we've had with Vietnam, with Korea, with Japan, and China. You know, so I wanted to bring these conversations about to my amazement, people are beginning to engage more like never before using this global platform, both photography and also social media. You know, so I, I'm in a very different place now because when I came up, it wasn't really like that. It right. was just really one sided. All I knew was black and brown communities. At 17, I went into the military and I went to Germany of all places. And I was able to, to, to see another coach outside my world. Just recently, I returned to Germany and I'm sitting down with the grandchildren of German soldiers that fought in World War II. Now imagine that. And we have in these intelligent conversations, matter of fact, at one of my art openings. And here I am, a black American man whose grandfather and uncle served in World War II. And I'm sitting with German young men and women whose fathers were in the German army, many never came back and we having conversations. So for me, that gave me a sense of hope and possibility and how as artists, we could change that narrative. And I'm really amazed that so many people are now opening their eyes. And I, along with so many other photographers are doing it. And I go back to what um, W.E. DeBose did back in the 1900s with the Negro Exposition in Paris and how that exhibition helped to change the narrative in terms of how black and brown people were being viewed. So I'm just trying to continue that in what I'm doing right now and again, through what I'm seeing, especially recently with what I've been putting out doing Vietnam, I had to deal with that conversation. And I'm amazed with how people responding around the world, angry behind racism, angry behind the, the census wars that we've had. So I'm very hopeful right now that artists can play a major role in change that narrative and causing people to be more empathetic to the struggle of those who are less fortunate. Thank you so much. Um, all three of you, thank you. The reason, not to, to give you the rationale behind the talk, um, the reason that I wanted to have this talk specifically with the three of you is while I think that the question is very valid, um, I am really interested in framing our voices in this type of conversation, because I do think often there is um, an expectation from mainstream audiences that we are the spokespeople as cultural producers. Somehow we go from simply being cultural producers to being representatives. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that as a really simple question, actually. Well, it's not, it's a simple question with probably many complicated answers. Um, but if you can each speak a little bit to what you think our responsibilities as visual culture makers are to not our community, but our communities. Um, because I don't think any of us, A, none of us exists as monolithic individuals. And in that way, none of us are really beholden to a single community. And so what does it mean to, what is our responsibility and what does that mean as artists? Um, I don't know who wants to start. Maybe I'll, I'll start with Sean. I mean, you're absolutely right, Jasmine. I have a few ways of tackling this question and, uh, and I'm, I'm gonna give a biographical backdrop uh, to how I would answer this. I identify as Afro-Latino and I'm from Queens primarily. I never grew up with a notion of difference because my block, I could hear eight languages on my block. And I could, I grew up with such a wide array of voices and personalities and backgrounds that it wasn't until I was thrown up against a white backdrop that I understood I was different primarily in high school and in college. I, I, I bring this forward again as the context in that I have always cherished and prided myself on my fluidity between communities because how I have found kinship in multiple identities. Now, with that being said, I have grown very wary of how community is named and labeled these right. days. 
primarily because on one end, we have the performative solidarity of white institutions that are quick to throw out a notion of community and then when pressed, never actually identify who those people are. And then on the other side, the equally performative solidarity of individuals that fall in kinship solely based on identity markers and for no other reason. And so in between, and black and brown folks are, are, are guilty of this as well, mm -hmm. of, of, of aligning themselves simply because the other individuals black or brown. And so what is lost in this notion of community is exactly what you, what you said, Jasmine, all the complexity and nuance that makes the human experience. And so I've become really allergic to the term. However, I will say this, there is accountability in my work and how I look at my work. And I, and I would suggest, I would name my community, those individuals that will counter me and the subjects and questions that I'm putting out into the world with generosity and expansiveness. Those are the individuals that I've started to identify as, uh, as community because at the core of what I live for is truth telling. Mm -hmm. And truth telling gets me in trouble no matter who I'm sp speaking to. There you go. Good trouble. Yeah. Well, I think, you know, before, before we shift on, I, question to consider, I think, is the difference between whether or not we have agency to choose this rhetorical question, but whether we have agency to choose our communities or is our sense of community imposed by another's gaze and perception of where, where we fall. Similarly to your point about affinity based purely on identity markers and um, I often wonder how much of our identities and communities are shaped by an expectation of those who are looking at us. Well, wow. you know, I think that there's a lot of that um, when, you know, nobody, it's not like I um, wanted to be an artist because there was an artist in my neighborhood. That's not what, that's not what happened. I went to museums and I thought I want to do that. Like my community goes all the way back to the caves of Lascaux. Like that's my community as an artist. All that stuff belongs to me, right? All of it, right? And so when I walk through a museum, I'm not walking through a white space. I'm walking through a museum as a black person who has ownership of all that sort of stuff because I'm an American, Like, right? And this is the other thing that is really um, sort of strange for me. I am really feeling a generational split the older I get, you know? I was born in 1963 in segregation, right? I didn't understand that black people would immigrate to America. Like that was not something that would, I was like, why would you move here? Like I didn't meet any immigrants until I was much, much older, right? Because the way that the country was set up was very much what Jamil was talking about, this sort of split between black and white, right? And so I'm in a different conversation, right? because I have a different life experience, right? And I'm completely fine with the way things are going, with the way like people of color are organizing themselves and doing stuff like that. But I have to keep in mind that my experience is different. So when we talk about people of color, right? That's not, that's like a universalized term in institutions. And I just look at people like, you know, I'm not, that's not me. That's not me, right? Um, the, the difference in the ways that people have been treated in this country. Um, you know, Tony, uh, Tony Morrison said almost every immigrant gets off a boat and figures out in like 15 minutes that the best thing is to not be black, right? And that's part of what it means to be American, right? That sort of pecking order of race, right? Now, I didn't come up with that, but I have to live with that. And so the great thing about um, Black Americans is that they have fought to make the country live up to its documents, right? And that hasn't just benefited Black Americans, that's benefited everybody, right. right? But the minute we start to talk about Black Americans as a separate group, 
people demand a sort of inclusiveness that's always been problematic for me, right? And the last thing I'll say about this is that, you know, there's people in all communities who don't know anything about art, right? And so when you're an artist and someone who doesn't know anything about art is telling you what you should and shouldn't be doing, why is that acceptable? Why are black voices somehow equal to someone who has spent their entire life studying a practice of making art, right? And that's something that when Sean talks about community, that's something that is really, really toxic to me. Because just because someone is a member of a group doesn't make them an authority on art. It really doesn't. And, art, and an authority on art is a real thing. Like Sean, me, Jamil, we sacrificed a great deal of um, things in order to learn and develop our craft. It was hard won, right? It's not like there's a lot of people around us supporting us to do this kind of work when we were younger, right? And we have had the good fortune of not dying and continuing to work. You know, that's how you get as a black artist, that's what you have to do. You have to not die. You have to keep working and not die and let people catch up to you. That's why Lorraine O'Grady has is in her 80s. Her 80s. She's a freaking genius. And she's in her 80s and she's finally getting the sort of first, quote unquote mainstream attention she deserves. Her first retrospective. Her first one. To me is so baffling. And I I thought maybe I had missed something just because I'm I'm young, but it's um it's really astounding that Carmen Herrera is the same way. Yeah. Yeah. Almost a hundred years old. And now we're talking about what a genius she was. Hmm. Cicely Tyson. People talk about Cicely Tyson like, oh, she was a great actress. Cicely, Cicely Tyson didn't get to do half the shit of which she was capable. She never got that opportunity. Yeah. Um, thank you for that. And mm -hmm. I just want to say, I, I always forget, even though I've read all of your bios so many times, that you're all older than me because you all look so great. It's a moisturizer, honey. <laughs> it's a really good moisturizer. I'll put it in the chat for you, the one I use. Really just good. putting it out there. Um, mm -hmm. Jamel, what is your, what's your take? What is, what is it, do you see as a responsibility to community or communities? Well, my responsibility right now is to uphold the legacy of those that suffered through the Middle Passage. You know, I am a survivor. You know, the, the torchlight has been passed on to me. I have a responsibility for those who are not here, those who were lynched, who were incarcerated, who were murdered. I am a survivor. So not only do I have a responsibility to uphold that torchlight, I also have a responsibility to inspire the next generation of creative artists to make a difference in this world. I'm striving to be a pathfinder for them so they could perhaps follow the path in which I am that I've been on and continue this very important work that needs to be done because there are so many voices out there right now. And I've been very fortunate to connect with them across the globe, young aspiring artists, both musicians, photographers, painters, you know, uh, 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 rappers who are looking for their voices. So as an elder, I feel I have a responsibility to help shape and mold them so they can continue in this fight because we need them. You know, we need to have our troops replenished. Mm -hmm. And I have a great sense of responsibility to do that in addition to use my various platforms to address issues that are going on around the world. It's very important for me to do that each and every day of my life to try to make some type of statement to inspire someone around the world you know, through, through the gift that I have. Because again, this divine gift of vision is something special that I hold very dear to having the ability to see, it's a gift. And with that comes a responsibility to be a light. And that's where I live for each and every day of my life. This is bigger than photography for me. This is about the survival of a people using that global language of, of, of art to inspire people. And that's what my life is all about right now. I live for it every single day. You know, I look to inspire someone and, and through technology, I'm able to have conversations with people all over and answer some of the questions they have, give them a sense of guidance, something I did not have when I was younger. You know, I had to go through the obstacles and the trials and tribulations to be where I'm at right now. And I'm very grateful 
for all those angels and guides that helped me along the path of life. And, and oftentimes what they said to me is the only thing we want in return is to give back. So that's all I want to do right now is, is, is just try to lend my voice to make a difference in the manner in which those before me came. You know what, Jamel, I, I just want to, yeah, amen. Thank you for that, because I, I, do, I do not want to leave that out of this conversation. While I've named accountability to the questions and uh, urgencies that I address in my work, I absolutely do feel responsible to artists that connect with my practice and that in, in which my practice resonates with them. I would also say that I do feel a responsibility to my mentors. And I want to bring Dr. David Driscoll's name into this space. When he oh, passed, cry. when he passed, I said to myself that very day, if you're leaving this world, it's because I got to do fucking something. Right. And I do feel responsible to that. So thank you for bringing that forward, Jamal. But, you know, I feel that same connection to the people whose hands um, taught mine how to do what I do. I feel that uh, connection to Betty Woodman you know, who was incredibly important to me, right? But I also hear what uh, Jamel is saying is like the, um, my mother never got to be a creative person. She never got that. And I'm not a deeply spiritual person, um, but I do have half of my mother's DNA, right? So I do believe that there's some part of her that lives on through the work that I make, right? And that's as far as I can go, right, with that sort of um, uh, legacy thing. But I do think that what Sean was saying earlier is the thing that's crucial to me is that I tell the truth. Like I have this skill, I have this ability to see like Jamel was talking about. And so I could, I could use that to make like um, really slick um, ad campaigns. Like I could do that, right? But instead, I want to make you look at the truth. And that's a choice, you know? And I'm not saying people who work in advertising are bad or whatever. Everybody has to make their choice. Everyone's got family to feed and bills to pay and stuff like that, right? I'm not hating on that, right? But I had to, I couldn't do anything other than tell the truth. Ooh, this conversation has has me on a emotional roller coaster. <laughs> Sorry, everyone. Um, you should have had an adult be beverage there for yourself. <laughs> Calm yourself I, don't, down. I don't know if that would have made it better or worse. <laughs> um, I have so many. Quite, I have like a list of questions in front of me. Um, but since we are talking about mentors and um, and honoring those who have come before us. I uh, I have a question that is going to kind of start with Jamel and Sean. Um, I think one of the reasons that our Sean, your show and the teen council exhibition where teens have come and curated um, an exhibition from our permanent collection. And that exhibition is really about teens seeing themselves in the work that they have selected, including Jamel's work. And I think one of the reasons that they work so well together is because they together create a kind of holistic viewpoint of what representing ideas and seeing ourselves in artwork means in completely different ways. And I think that's why it's so, it resonates um, to have, again, this, this this way of uh, exploding monolithic ideas. And so my question now to all of you is thinking about the future groups of young artists, young curators, um, how do you see your role in pushing them forward and in creating space and, and mentorship. Um, you know, I know Steve and Sean, you're both involved in Skowhegan. And I know Jamel that, um, you know, working with youth, you've talked to our teens in the past before. So I'm just wondering if you can all speak a little bit on the future makers. Um, and yeah, I guess 
whoever wants to start. Well, first, I want to uh, congratulate the, the team council for putting forth such a great exhibition, what we call home. Yes, they did a fantastic so, job. Of course, they represent our future. And I'm so happy that there's various organizations within the city that are nurturing the youth, both in the Schaumburg, you have uh, the young curators. At the Student Museum in Harlem, you have those that are following the spirit of James Van Der Zee with expanding the walls. And uh, you have the, the youth of ICP. You know, so I'm happy that institutions are helping to produce, to shape and mold this next generation of creative minds that hold the key to our future. You know, so for, for me, again, my role is just to be an elder and a guide and a student because I've learned so much from them. You know, despite my age and my experience, I still consider myself a student. I might be a little wiser due to my journey, but I'm here to, to, to try to aid them in, in any way in which I can because we need their voices right now. And there's something powerful about the curators, these young visionaries that we need to make this world a better place. So my thing is to encourage them, every opportunity I get when I see them, both to encourage them but at the same time, going back to what I said earlier, to help to develop the next generation of visionaries. Because a lot of kids we have, are born with that divine gift, but it has to be brought out and nurtured and encouraged. And there's a lot of young people struggling right now. So it's a coming upon those who have been on this path a little longer to try to give them as much guidance as, as we can because they're in dire need right now. So that's what I'm striving to do right now because again, they represent the future of tomorrow and we need them more now than ever before. I personally feel that politicians and religious leaders have failed. So it's a coming upon the art, the global art community to get all their young curators together and visionaries to help to make this world a better place. And going back to what I shared earlier about my experience in Suwon, Korea, with these young B-boys from around the world, they came together embracing a craft that was born in the Bronx, hip hop. And now they're battling on the dance floor versus battling on the battlefield. And all of these young men of men of military age, they can easily be in elite armies around the world, but they've embraced hip hop and they battle on that. So that allowed me to see the power of art and how art could be used to make this world a better place. And to just mind you, a lot of them let me speak English, but they listen to American hip hop and they dance off that frequency. They're all on that same frequency. And in doing so, they are making this world a better place. So again, we need all the visionaries on a global level to be proactive, to try to lend their voice and make a better world because they're going to inherit it. And we need them right now, like never before. I got to tell you to that point, I am endlessly impressed by just the level of knowledge and understanding and conscientiousness that all of the teens who I have encountered have like leaps and bounds ahead of where I was at that age and probably am right now. And it's, um, it's very encouraging to me to see teens, even younger, younger kids um, embracing the possibilities of being in art and culture. Sorry, Sean, go ahead. I wanna, I wanna say two things um, in terms of how I consider mentorship. The first is, particularly as a young person growing up in Queens with very little exposure to contemporary art, no one taught me how to navigate systems. Hmm. No one taught me how to navigate institutions, whether financially or, or, via, or through relationships. That piece of it is crucial for black and brown artists because if that, if that piece is, in my point of view, intentionally left out of formalized uh, grad school or the, the quote unquote professionalized systems of schooling. I also believe what is crucial in the cultural space is guiding folks in their own voice. And what, what I mean by that is somehow, and this is something that Steve and I have talked about at, at great lengths, we're in a very dangerous cultural context in which liberation is being equated with only celebratory imagery and commentary. That to me is a very dangerous space to be. And so when I encounter mentees, one of the first questions that I have them addressed is, what are you saying differently? What is the question 
that is not being asked that you need to give voice to. It was so beautiful, Sean. I mean, I just, yeah, if you, I'm telling you, he's probably one of the best artists this country has produced, seriously. Um, I um, am not someone who, I mean, I teach for a living. You know, why well, I teach as a profession, right? Um, I'm not that fond of young people because I think that they are very easily swayed, right? And my job, like I said before, is to tell them the truth. And like I said, I grew up in Detroit um, and I didn't have the prettiest upbringing, right? And the message I got very early on was that no one's ever, no one's gonna love you. Mm -hmm. So you have to do it yourself, baby. You gotta do it yourself. So you have to survive whether or not there's black joy. You have to survive whether or not anyone is supportive. You have to survive whether or not there's someone who looks like you. You have to go, you have to go. And um, I didn't go to school um, because I wanted to be around white children. I went to school because I knew that I had to learn. That was my only ticket out, right? And I tried to tell my students that Instagram and immediate gratification are ruining their perception of culture. I try to get them to understand that. That just because everybody on Instagram hates something doesn't mean that it's bad, right? That's not what that means. Just because um, some influencer says something is toxic or problematic, that doesn't mean that it's true, right? I try to remind my students of things like symbolism, metonymy, synecdoche, all these sorts of things that are the province of the artist. Yeah. I also try to get people to discard this, um, the notion of always thinking the worst of the artist. And uh, you know, I, 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 I love Sean like he's my own child, I really do. And um, I was really ready to cut somebody when they came at him for the body of work that's on view at the Bronx Museum, saying that he was trying to do something hurtful, right? The assumption that people are doing something to hurt other people is part of internet culture, right? And that's something that we have to interrogate. And that's why Jamel is so sophisticated and so brilliant at using this platform the sort of social media platform to educate, right? And that kind of attention to those kinds of um, um, interventions is really, really important. But what we need to teach young people is that everything is not measured in clicks. The world is not organized around your joy. You know, the world was fine before you got here and it will be fine after you're gone, right? So what is important is what you do in the meantime in between those two moments, right? And it's not what you post about or what you say you're doing. It's about what you actually do. It's about where you show up, right? And, you know, all three of us have taken the blows for our work, all three of us, right? So, I mean, I, I, I put my career up against anybody's. I'm fine with it. I'm fine with the way things played out, right? If I had been a nicer person, or if I had um, agreed with more nonsense, I probably would have had a different career. But I was, I'm not designed that way. I'm just not, right? And that had to be okay. But I also knew deep in my heart that it didn't matter if anybody liked me. It didn't matter if they called me names. It didn't matter if they called me faggot. It, none of that shit mattered. It didn't matter because that was not gonna stop me. Anyway, the, Toni Morrison said the, the main function of racism is to stop you from doing your work. That is the main function, you know? So I tell my students all the time, do your work, just do your work. That's all that matters. I think that's actually the perfect way to open it up for questions. So if anyone has questions, 
Um, now is a great time to put them in either the chat or the Q&A. Um, and we'll start. My question is, I want to trade work with Jamel and Sean, uh, if that would be cool. If there's a particular painting that either of you want, happy to send it to you, like wrap it, send it to you. So just, I just want to get that out of the way because I need to add to my art collection. Thank you. You got it. You have to put it out there in public, right? Account talk about accountability. Send it to you. It's recorded now. <laughs> <laughs> well, while I'm, oh, oop, oop, oop. Okay. Questions coming in into the chat. Um, there was an earlier, oh, sorry, okay. Um, how do you distinguish between honest and open empathy by white viewers of your work? And what, what is something else, assumption, a kind of appropriation? Mm. Yeah, let me get up on this one. Okay. I read that earlier. <clears throat> We need to better assess the ways that art operates. Mm -hmm. And by that, I mean, and, I'll, and let me speak for self. I truly believe that the work that is on view in Breath of Empty Space and the Breath of Empty Space is not a representation, hence the title of this panel, of the traumatic imageries that we receive and in the media noise and the media cycle, it is a different presentation which invites a contemplative viewing. Right. You will only know that once you see the work. I can therefore enable decisions, strategies in my craft that will solicit empathetic witnessing. And in that acknowledge the fetidization acknowledge the appropriation, acknowledge all the problematics of a white gaze and not accept that as my burden. Right. That is for white people to deal with. Yeah. Thank you. Do, Steve or Jamel, do you wanna to respond to that question as well? No, I just think it's very hard for white people to, um, to not be white. Like, I mean, I just think that's really hard. And I, um, because you get, I mean, there's prizes involved in being white. There's like dominance, there's all this sort of stuff. And people act like white people can't understand uh, racism. Like white people invented racism. Of course they understand it. Of course they understand it. Why are they pretending like they don't, right? And so that empathy you feel, that like feel that, feel that, feel the shame, feel it. Like that. that's on you, like that's not, me, I have to live with this shit all the time. So like, I don't have time to help you unpack your feelings about me being murdered. Like, I don't have time to do that. I can't do that for you, right? It's very hard. And like, I gotta tell you, like a lot of white people in this country got sold a bill of goods that they were better than other people and that somehow things didn't affect them. Like it, it, it didn't happen to them. Like they all think like, oh, uh, I, I could never have been a slave owner. It's like, you, got, you have an iPhone in your pocket, right? You have some relationship to like forced labor, just so you know. And if nobody told you before today, I just told you. So now you know, okay? Now you know, right? So, I mean, that kind of thing, like um, um, the refusal to um, engage, you have to engage and you have to mess up and you have to feel Badly, you know, I have a I have a goddaughter who is a trans person, you know, I mess up in conversations with her. Right. But um, in the space of love, she can tell me when I mess up and I can take responsibility for that. And then we can just move the hell on. But I can't sit here and, and hold your hand while you have your feelings about um, about how horrible it is that black people are treated. I, 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 I can't do that for you. Right. I think you bring up a, a really good point um, that I want to reiterate, which is um, about the idea of understanding nuance and moving on. And as I'm saying this, I'm thinking about what you were saying about social media um, and this idea that when you mess up or say something unpolitically correct, whatever it is, you're automatically canceled. 
-hmm. And we lack this ability to have nuance and forgiveness and uh, thinking about calling in instead of calling out. And like, because you never made a mistake in your life. Right. You know what I mean? That's the thing that is so astonishing to me. Right. And I think one of the things that that is happening that curtails discussions is people are so petrified of doing the wrong thing and then subsequently being canceled that we end up in a state of paralysis that doesn't allow us um, collectively or, or in independent groups to move forward. Well, see, this is the thing, Jasmine. People, instead of actual critique, what you have is a series of people who are looking for where other people have messed up. Mm -hmm. That's what they're looking for. They're just looking for the spot where someone has messed up and then they can discount everything you've done and they can feel better about themselves, right? That is, that's the soul, that's, I'm all fine with critique. I'm fine with people like analyzing my work and talking about the critical relationships and where it succeeds and where it fails, all that sort of stuff. But if you want to go through all my tweets and find like something untoward I said back when I was 16 years old, which was a no, 16 is too long, like 10 years ago, whatever I was on Twitter, <laughs> right? If you want to do that, if that's how you want to spend your time, go ahead. And I'm fine to have that conversation with you. But this is the thing. People make mistakes. People make mistakes. There's a difference between making a mistake and intentional cruelty, right? And you're coming at people like you're trying to, you're a horrible person because you are exploiting the murder of this child. It's like, you know what? I did a whole series of drawings of white people who murdered black people. Whole bunch of them, almost a hundred, right? White people, mur- and I made that many because I could make that many, right? So, and people were calling me saying like, you should draw so-and-so because there are other people I haven't gotten to, right? So if, White people want to have a conversation. Have a conversation about that. Talk about that. You know, don't talk about what I did or what Sean did to like um, to exploit or something like that. Talk about what I did. I'm exploiting whiteness. Come for me. But you know, no one's going to come for me because that's about whiteness. That's what that's about. Well right. said. Yeah. I'm going to move on to the next question, because I think it's a good one um, for all of you. And to answer, someone had asked a question before, before I move on to this question. Um, So everyone knows this um, talk is recorded and it will be available um, and included in that will be- Jasmine, I'm sorry for swearing. I'm sorry. I have a potty mouth, I'm sorry. I don't care. We're all, I assume we're all adults here. Can we bleep that out? Yeah, okay, well, we'll bleep that out. (laughs) Um, But the poem, um, Jimin's poem will be available in that recording. And I think, Sean, there was a question about possibly sharing the letter. Um, Maybe you can ask Jimin. Yes, I will ask Jimin. Okay, Um, so to this next question, when being a truth teller, is there an internal barometer that you test the work against to keep you moving through those conversations as you grow? To me, going back to my recent post on um, social media, uh, dealing with the war in Vietnam, I had to deal with with a situation that is very painful for a lot of people, but I had to do it because it's something I had with inside me that I need to get out and I needed answers. And I wanted to hold this government accountable for what they did during that war because it impacted me directly and so many people I knew. So. I just felt the need that I had to do it. Regardless of what people felt, I felt it was, a, it, was, it was an urgent conversation. Despite the fact that we've had so many wars after Vietnam, I had to rewind and go back to a time period that took so many men away from my community and, and the larger communities, in addition to the Vietnamese people that died in Vietnam, you know, millions of people. So I had to challenge that and say, the hell with it. This is something I got to redress. Despite the fact that so many years have passed, I got to tackle some of these tough issues. And not only just Vietnam, but a host of other issues that I feel oppressing. Even in our, I share images on, on my uh, instant feed, uh, instant stories about rape and different wars that are going on. I have to do it. Right. You know, I, I can't play softball in a time 
when we are, are, are really, to be honest with you, we're at war. Mm -hmm. And I feel the need when I wake up every day that I got to put something out in the universe and make people think, to become more, more empathetic, to be more proactive. So, you know, it's just something I got to do, regardless of what people feel. It is what it is. You accept it or reject it, but I got to get it out and share it with the universe because that's what I want to do. You know what I mean? My work is bigger than me right now. I, 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 I built a platform. Now I'm trying to encourage others. You know, this past, I'm taking advantage of a woman's history month right now. And not, I don't like that word advantage. Let me go back. I'm striving to use women's history month as an opportunity to elevate women that are out there on the front lines, making art that is provocative art this about social change so it's something i got to do it's, this thing is bigger than me i've done all i could as an artist right now my goal and objective right now is to help others get out there on the front lines or even those who are already there to continue to encourage them in this fight right now and that's what i'm all about right now you know just trying to do that regardless of what people feel that's where i'm at i got to encourage these next generations i got to continue to engage in subject matters that are that are not that are, that are hurtful but at the same time they are, they deal reality as I said on, on, in my Instagram, I'm trying to provoke thought and action in everything I do. It's all done with intention, you know, to, to, to try to spark conversations. Yeah. And those conversations are taking place because sometimes we forget about them. We could put Vietnam behind us. We could put Iraq behind us. We could put Afghanistan behind us. But millions of people have died, right. even with the Native Americans and the massacres that took place in this country. I have to bring that back up, you know what I mean? Because I'm angry behind things that happen. Just recently, I, I watched the movie Detroit about the, the, the rebellion that took place in, in 1965. And it angered me. And I'm glad that it was shown because we need to be reminded. So here we have soldiers coming back from Vietnam and they are brutalized, a community is being attacked. And here these men went and put their lives on the line and you come back to this type of atrocities. So I had to bring that back up. And I feel that that's a part of my responsibility. Regardless of what you feel, things may not, I just can't do the nice stuff no more. I've done it, you know, the fun images and make people laugh and talk about the sneakers and the poses and all that. That's fine, but that's superficial. Right. I need to address issues that are more urgent and pressing than deal with stuff that to me is just, it's just basic. So right. uh, that's where I'm at right now. Again, everything I do is with intention to, to, to stir a conversation and to create action. He ain't nowhere near finished. <laughs> you know what I mean? Right. Nowhere near finished, right? You know. Well, yeah. I want to give hey, both. Yeah, no, yeah, I just want to add one more. thing, Jasmine, I, um, and I'll, I'll try to be succinct in terms of the internal barometer. Uh, you know, there's a, there's, there's, there's still, there's still, there's, uh, remains this mystique around the artist in that we are somehow protected in our studio. The work that is on view at the Bronx Museum uh, doesn't exists for me simply as a commentary on police violence. I see myself in the bodies and spirits of all of these individuals that have, been, have lost their lives. Yep. My internal barometer is, if I look into their eyes, if I look at these scenes and I'm brought to tears because of how it implicates my history, my life, my fear, my fear for my daughter's life, then I have to create. That is my internal barometer. If I am emotionally stirred, just like Brother Jamel is saying here, that is the fuel. This work is my way of grappling with our existence. Mm -hmm. that's, that's what guides me. You know, there's something about sitting down with a 8H pencil and looking at a photograph of Dylan Roof, who murdered nine people, and using all of my skills as a portraitist to draw him, right? I believe that there's something really, really powerful in that action. And, you know, I, I have my own feelings about um, that person as I'm doing that work, but it's important to do because I don't want anyone to tell me that that is beyond understanding, not beyond understanding. I understand Dylan Roof perfectly well. I understand him just fine, right? So that's unimaginable. How can that happen? No, no, stop, stop, right? Because it's happening. What Jamel said, it's happening. It's happening right now. Native Americans are still living 
with what's happened. They're still living with it, right? And so to be silent is to be complicit. That's the bottom line. And as a visual artist, I, I, I'm, I'm not, I, I can't afford to be complicit. But I do appreciate, Jasmine, the conversation. And I appreciate the way that you framed it. Because this is a conversation that we need to keep having. And we really need to hold our peers to account when we talk about community, right? What are we talking about when we talk about community? Really, what are we talking about? And why are some people forced to talk about it and other people are not? Right. So I was going to ask just one more question, okay. but there are two really good ones. Can, do the three of you have time for just two more? No, I got nothing going on. Okay. <laughs> okay. So the first one um, is how can educators embolden their students to to persevere when they struggle with their creative process, feel free to be candid. Several of my students are in the audience. Mm. I have a good story about this. Tell us. When I was in graduate school, a hundred years ago, Lisa Yuskovich, who's a great artist, great painter. Uh, she did, um, she's doing crits with us. And fortunately it wasn't my painting she was talking about, right? But uh, one of my uh, colleagues had a painting up and we were talking about it. And they were talking about all this stuff about theory and all this sort of stuff, right? And Lisa said, all that stuff is really well and good. But if you want me to be interested in this painting, that shadow had better be fucking extraordinary, right? So I say to students all the time, you have to make me care. That's your job. You have to make me want to look. That is your job, right? And if I don't want to look, we got nothing. All your ideas, all your thoughts, all your big um, concepts, all that, none of that stuff matters if you don't make me look. So you got to learn how to make me look, baby. Good answer. Yeah, I think that's good. <laughs> <laughs> Y'all are funny. <laughs> oh. uh, I, I also, I concur. I think that's a great, a great uh, answer. Lisa, she's, garbage, though. she's really, she's the OG, really. I yeah. think I'm just going to start telling all my students that. <laughs> exactly. Sorry, you're it's really true. Um, okay, so here is um, the last question. It's something that I was actually thinking about quite a bit. Um, during this conversation, something that I've also been talking with my students about quite a bit. And it, the question is, <clears throat> in terms of representation, how do you feel about critiques or conversations that artists shouldn't be able to access or represent stories if they're not their own? Yes, specifically thinking about some reactions to the life, lives and deaths that Sean is exploring in this exhibition, in short, who owns content? What is one's own? In quotation marks. I, I'm gonna. I, I'd love to hear Stephen Jamel's uh, response to this. No, you don't. Um, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm gonna first respond via question. Did I ask for access when it was played over and over in the news? Did I, did I ask to be punished by the trauma and deaths captured on cell phones? I think it's, of course, a sensitive question. I think the question of ownership is misconstrued. I believe that the work addresses a public image and collective trauma. Mm -hmm. And I also believe we have to create a distinction from the act of making, from the act of exhibiting mm -hmm. and the politics of both. I don't ask permission for my work. I create images that tell the truth and that I feel are necessary but I 
am sophisticated and wise enough to understand the politics of exhibiting and proximity to trauma and engaging in those necessary conversations with care and accountability. There's a difference. Well said. The only thing I would add is, um, you know, when Warhol made a painting of Jackie Onassis at um, JFK's funeral, right? When Keith Haring included an image of the murdered Malcolm X in a painting, right? When, um, when Roger Vander Weyden painted the Madonna and child, that was not his story, right? So this notion that artists are only sort of doing stuff that with which they have a direct relationship is sort of insane, right? How many of you have ever met a Wookiee, right? How many of you have ever been to Hogwarts, right? But somehow I'm supposed to make something that has a direct relationship to my own experience, right? You got motherfuckers speaking Elvish, right? figuring that shit out, right? But I somehow can only talk about my poor, pathetic Black life. And I'm not allowed to use any of the tools like appropriation, like modernism, like gestural abstraction, like mimetic portraiture. I'm not allowed to use any of that stuff, right? Because there's a one-to-one -one relationship between what I do and what I make, right? That is an incredibly oppressive way to treat black creators. Okay, so like, let's just stop it. Black people get to do whatever they want. You get to do whatever they want. Yeah, I can make a whole series of, of paintings about bunnies. I can do whatever I want, right? I don't have to answer to you, right? People forget that when they talk about art, they're talking about themselves. That's about you. That's about you, baby. That's not about me. Sean did his work. And now you're having all your feelings about it and you want to blame him. Like, no, baby, that's about you. That's about you. I get heated thing, when I hear this kind of The only thing I want to add, Jasmine, and maybe this is a point to, to leave on, at least from my voice, is uh, I, I don't, I, I make work. I make work and I would suggest Steve and Jamel make work that is as important about a vision and a world a hundred years from now as it is today. Mm -hmm. The story, the narratives that are present in our work are valuable for generations well after I'm off this earth. That's why I make things. Right. History will tell the story. And history will decide if my work is necessary or not. That is an excellent way to close out. Um, I want to end by thanking all of you. Um, Steve, I look forward to those bunny paintings. And I also think you should do stand up. <laughs> and um, really, genuinely, thank you so, so much for indulging me in this conversation. Thank you to all of you who attended. Um, and as I mentioned before, this a recording of this conversation, um, as well as Jimin's poem will be available on our website. So thank you all and enjoy the beautiful spring weather. Thank you. All as well. Thank you so much. I've, I've gained the wealth of knowledge from everyone. Let's stay connected. Yes, let's so, do. Okay. So honored that the two of you would even be here with me, for real. I want, I, I want a really big photograph, Jamel, like a really big one. I'll show you the one that I want on the website. I'll just, I'll just send you a picture of it. Okay. Don't worry about that. Just hit me with the DM. We are talking. All right. You guys take care. Continue. A blessing. Uh, Thank you, y'all. We are the radical voices. Uh, That's what's Absolutely. up. Absolutely. Right. Jasmine. Friend. Thank you so much, Jasmine. Thank you so much, Bronx Museum. <laughs>